Kate Sneed with K. Sneed Consulting. These are my co-presenters. Want to introduce yourselves? Perry Jowsey. And Deborah Schaum. And we're just going to talk about um, the actual implementation of using Civi CRM, kind of from a case study perspective. So using their organization, Reach Out and Read. So we're going to just introduce ourselves, go over a little bit of who we are first. So I have been using um, Civi for just over a year. Um, consulting on this very small nonprofits, um, implementing and using Civi CRM within their organization. Uh, Perry Jowsey again. I I'm development director with Reach on Read Colorado. Um, I've been doing fundraising for nearly 15 years. Not a technical person, um, so this is the kind of workshop that would have been valuable to me. Uh, a year, two years ago, and trying to think about how to bring in and really upgrade our database for our infrastructure for a fundraising system. I first saw Civi um, in, I think, 2011. And I remember seeing it in, at the time just from kind of a distance, not from a, a user perspective, but from an organization that was doing it. And I remember thinking at the time, this is something that really has the potential to emerge um, and really be a major tool uh, in resource development because, um, you know, in managing budgets and so forth, you know, we're, we're using systems like Razor's Edge, you know, the Cadillac of databases and so forth and paying a lot for it. Um, or even smaller scale. I, I mean, I've worked with a lot of organizations. I use a lot of different databases. And so I saw this as an opportunity to do something to, you know, with the open source to, to do it in a way that was affordable, uh, that would really be an asset to the organization from, an, from a return on investment standpoint and an expense standpoint and so forth. And so fast forward all these years later with Reach Out and Read Colorado, uh, coming on board to the organization, um, there had been a database in place that I had never seen in all of my years. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and some of the uniquenesses with that. And so we we're trying to think about as we went through the frustrations of trying to raise money and do our jobs uh, and things taking us five times as long as they should have and not having data as clean as it should be, how can we kind of get up more to really a best practice system and put in place a database uh, that was going to meet those needs? Um, and so uh, Civi CRM kind of came back onto the uh, table. And again, from the user perspective, just the brief uh, instances I had seen with it, I knew it would be something, you know, we could as an organization widely adapt and benefit from. What we didn't know how to do, we have the first clue about doing is how to bring the, you know, transform, uh, migrate, if you will, our current data, our present at the time database to Civi CRM. We had no concept of how to do that and really how to get in the nuances up to speed. Again, being a non-technical person, how to have it work uh, and talk with our website, which was in WordPress and so forth. And so uh, a year ago, uh, we began these conversations with Kate and so what you'll see is really a little bit of the soup to nuts to how we made that happen. I'm Deborah Schoen. I'm the office manager at Reach Out and Read Colorado. Uh, and my perspective would be more from the data input to um, entering donations, um, pulling mailing lists, and things like that. Um, so not the, necessarily the, the fundraising aspect of it. Um, but I think Perry did a fantastic job of explaining what our situation was. We had an outdated uh, database. It was called Sage Fundraising, and we could log on to it from our national organization server. So only one person could be on it at a time because we were essentially remote logging in. Um, so the constant question in our office was, are you in Sage? Are you in Sage? Are, are you in Sage? Um, so that was one issue. Secondly, being an outdated version, uh, they chose to no longer support it, um, and so we couldn't get updates for it, and the national organization was not interested in getting uh, more recent versions of it, so that kind of put us in a tight spot. Um, and we were large enough and independent enough that we decided we could have our own um, and then migrate all of, our, uh, all of our contacts and all the information we had there onto our own service. We just didn't know how to go about doing that. So. Uh, we met Kate at Civi Day um, and started conversations and then decided this was the way to go. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about what Reach Out and Read does? And oh, sure. Here. Um, so Reach Out and Read Colorado, we um, are the Colorado Coalition of the National Organization. We are in all 50 states 
um, and U.S. territories, I believe. Um, we give books to kids through doctor's offices, in a nutshell. Um, we found that, and advice to parents on the importance of reading aloud to their kids starting at a very early age. So we focus on kids from six months to five years before they start school, get books in their hands and get the parents reading to them because we found that that simple intervention has, you know, does a world of wonders. Um, we give uh, brand new, culturally appropriate, age appropriate books um, within the well child check setting. So when you take your child in to get their regular well child check, which is free, um, and we do serve a, a majority of low income families, um, the parent, the not the parent, the, um, the provider, whoever's seeing your child, will use the book as a developmental assessment tool to assess how the child is, is progressing. Um, also give the book as a, you know, a takeaway or something to take home and build their home library of children's books. And also talk to the parent about um, how to engage with your child with a book. Um, have that parent bonding time. If you can't read the story, it doesn't matter. Uh, talk about the pictures, make funny sounds, make it an enjoyable experience so that when your child does enter school, they are familiar with what a book looks like. They know to open it. They know that the little black scribbles on the bottom mean words and they're the same words every time. Um, so that's what we do. And I would just add, from a budget perspective, five years ago, the organization was a $400,000 annual operating budget. Uh, this year, we're projected to go 1.1 million or so. So we've, we've grown. But the point of that to say is that um, you know, being cost efficient and frugal um, in how we apply our resources is very important to us. That's why we didn't you know, go sign up for you know, a $20,000 database. Um, and so what we'll walk through here is, um, I think from our perspective, how, how we went through the process in a, co in a, in a uh, affordable way, um, you know, from, and Kate will take us through like the migration and a little bit of the technical end, and we'll talk a little bit about the user end and acclimating to it. And then I think um, between the three of us, open it up for kind of round table to questions. Yeah, perfect. And just a little more background, they're currently only using Civi CRM for their donor um, information. There is possibility that down the road program information will be stored in Civi RSM, but right now it's strictly for their donor database. So let's just go ahead and jump right on into the beginning. So kind of the the basis of this presentation is if you, you've made the decision within your organization that you want to use Civi CRM now, you just don't know what to do or where to go from there, which is basically kind of what they had, Reach Out and Read had made that decision by the time we met last year. So um, the first kind of step in the process is to figure out where are you going to host um, your Civi CRM. So if you are going to host it locally, meaning on a, uh, an internal server, so a lot of government um, agencies usually end up doing this for security reasons um, within the government, but um, you can get the same securities and stuff web-based. So um, for this instance, um, Reach Out and Read was using WordPress, so they needed to, we were going to put it on the back end of their WordPress um, site, which is a pl for those of you who know WordPress, it's a plugin in WordPress. Um, and so before we did that, we, they had to kind of upgrade their hosting services. So where they were hosting their website, um, they were using a shared <coughs> server through Bluehost, and um, we had to figure out, make a decision before we did absolutely anything on what's the next step, where are you gonna continue to host with Bluehost, which is fine, and upgrade or go somewhere else. I got you. Kind of jumped on your slide, sorry. That's okay. I, I, one thing I would add to that is it living on the back end of the WordPress site was really valuable, you know, from the user standpoint. And again, um, 
you know, different organizations are different, but having worked with similar size organizations, budgets anywhere from 700,000 to, you know, 1.5 million, a lot of the um, products that we use from a database standpoint, you know, we couldn't remote into. It was like, uh, you know, it, it just didn't live in an easy way on the back end of the website, unless physically I was on my computer kind of going in through the software, like an e-tapestry or something like that. Um, you know, there was no way to access it you know, basically at any time in real time. And so that was a big plus, of course. Um, keep in mind from a very small grassroots organization, sometimes there's a lot of concern. Oh, well, everything's living, you know, on the web basically now, you know. And so that was something, you know, we had to kind of confront, um, you know, as a, uh, I guess, as a perception, right, and to be able to talk about that. And so our capacity wasn't, you know, in its uh, form at the time, just ready to do it, just a small tweak and a very small, um, you know, kind of price differential to do that. I got nothing to add. <laughs> so at, at this point also, we just to kind of, for those who are entering this and kind of trying to figure out costs and things like that, because we talked a lot about with Reach Out and Read about, well, what is the cost to use of eSerum? Yes, it's a free download, but there's costs associated with it. So this was a breakdown that um, we did specifically for them around hosting and that they were on this, they were currently on this Bluehost Shared Basic and our options on that they needed to get onto a some kind of a private server and what their options were for that. So this was one of the where the cost comes in and you just renewed mm -hmm. for this year and it was 350 i think mm -hmm. right for the year right so the so you guys are on the vps mm -hmm. now then mm -hmm. yeah and you can clearly see you know our what we looked at was what we currently had and could we just upgrade from that or did we need to go to something like civi host which offers the same things and was you know toted to us as a very good solution um, so we decided, are we comparing apples to apples and did the price comparison? And as you can see on the bottom line, what we had wasn't quite good enough, but we could easily make it good enough at a fraction of the cost. So that's and, the choice we made. And, and we also talked about not, they were on Bluehost and they had someone else who was helping with the, the, their WordPress website and not having to completely move to a totally right. different um, system too was part of that. Um, so when it comes to then, you've made this decision, you've installed, um, and I'm going to try and keep it non -tech, not very technical. So you, once you've decided where you're hosting, you go through the process of installing um, or in their situation, hire someone to do the, insta the install for you. And then it's, okay, now we want all of our data here. How do we get it there? And this is, um, a, a, can be one of the most lengthy processes, but it's really figuring out where does your current data live? So are you in Excel spreadsheets? Are you on Sage 50 for them? Are you in Razor's Edge? Are you in, you don't even have any current data? You know, the different, just really figuring out where, what your current data is, where it's living, and then how can it be, how can we access it? So is it um, easy to access? Is it, again, just a, you have it on your computer, do we have to log in somewhere else to get it, et cetera? And then figuring out, okay, so here's all this data that I have. These are the field names or what it's currently called. Now I need to move it over to Civi CRM. Where in Civi CRM is it going to live? And again, we haven't done absolutely anything. This is just going through and talking through the process, um, talking through what are your how does your organization workflow, who does what, all of those kinds of things, and literally saying, okay, this field in our old database is going to live in this field in Civi CRM, um, and, and kind of getting a reference point so that once you do make it the change over, then you know where it's gonna be. And at this point also then, is there the right place for this? Do we need to create custom fields? Um, and, and, and we did a, a, some data cleanup. Luckily, with Reach Out and Read, they had some pretty clean data, but at this point, it's a great idea to do your data cleanup. Don't, as I always say, junk in is junk out. So if you're gonna put a bunch of junk in Civi CRM, then you're gonna get a bunch of junk out of it. So this is your chance to really clean it up, have it be what you want, and then put it in Civi CRM so that when you're running reports and doing things in Civi, you're getting what you want, not a whole bunch of information that you don't want. In, in terms of mapping, you know, bringing the data over and, and 
um, you know, kind of figuring out what we wanted to happen. I, I guess I would say, you know, the in, in nonprofits, small nonprofits, we wear a lot of hats. And so, you know, as a development director, I, in the, you know, I previously, I've, I've actually done some things in WordPress. I'm like the least technical guy in the world, but I was introduced to the WYSIWYG and, you know, things of that and, you know, doing editing and, and that nature. And so all that to say, you know, in, in theory, what we were kind of confronting is in theory, we can do this all ourselves, right? It's kind of like a do-it-yourself project at home. In theory, I could rewire my house too, right? That's theoretically possible. Um, I think what we were trying to make the assessment of is, um, you know, how do we, how do we look at things and you know, kind of get the greatest the greatest return. Um, we're not technical people. Yes, we we think we could you know kind of do some of the learning. That's what all of these forums are you know kind of geared toward. Um, I mean, some are more on the really technical developer end, right? Um, but how could you know kind of basic non technical people you know kind of be be involved in this process? We kind of know what we want. We knew the theoretical components. We wanted the the functionality to have, um, but the technical part. Um, you know, and we talked about this uh, was was something we decided not to do, and I think that um, you know when when doing this mapping, what was what was good for us is, you know, we weren't we weren't just looking at you know Kate was said the junk in junk out. We weren't just looking at what the current uh, what the what the former system could do. Um, again, having a background in development, I knew all the things, all the bells and whistles that a Razor's Edge database could do, and I wanted to, you know, not just replicate what we were doing in, in another form, but really design a best practice database for the minimal amount of cost possible. And, uh, you know, again, having used Razor's Edge with two national organizations that I worked with, um, I can say as we were sitting down and going through some of the mapping process that we were able to put into place systems to me that are indistinguishable from, you know, from, from those national, um, you know, high powered, high priced databases that we used. And so that was really um, an encouraging process. We had a lot of, um, you know, uh, I think just like any organization, things that were unique to us that we were, um, you know, kind of how we stored data and how we use data. And I think what was, um, and I think you can talk a little bit about that in a second, but I think um, what we found is that this, uh, by using Civi CRM, doing it with Kate, you know, to kind of talk through, um, you know, where we wanted it to go. It was customizable. You know, we could we could really do it in a way that went toward those best practice elements, but still kind of maintain and, and capture some of the things that were unique to us that we had been capturing before. Mm -hmm. And you, you've led me in perfectly to uh, events and solicitations and things like that, but I wanted to backtrack just a second to say there's a, um, like a sample Civi CRM that you can download. And then you can see exactly what it looks like and what the fields are already named. Um, so that'll give you an idea of what you're working with. So you may have the same uh, fields in what you're currently using, and great, it can go from one uh, database to the next. But if what you're using has different names for those fields or you want to create uh, new fields, there it's, it's totally customizable. But I would highly recommend um, attending something like Civi Day, which most of you probably already have, because um, they'll show sample screenshots, um, so you get an idea of what everything looks like and how it works, um, and then also download that uh, that sample, so you can play around with it and find out how you pull somebody's name for a mailing list or how you would enter a new record or something like that. Um, I know that that was helpful for us in figuring out what we wanted to transfer over. Um, Something that was unique to us is in our old system, we could tag every single donation to something. So we could call it a corporate gift, we could call it an individual gift, we could relate it to an event, we could, uh, you know, so every single gift had its own um, tag, and then we would use those tags in pulling our reports. So we could find out at the end of, year, end, end of the year exactly how much we got in individual giving, exactly how much we got in foundation grants and, such like, and something like that. Um, Civi did not have that exact capability. So something we had to um, figure out 
and it's really just a matter of, oh, we don't do it like this anymore, we do it like this. But how we coded each record type is how we now pull um, our giving reports. So if something labeled as a corporate record, we'll pull all corporate records and get all the gifts from that perspective. Or if something is coded an individual record, we can pull all individual giving for the year. So while we can't pull based on exact gifts, how a record is categorized is how we do it now. So again, just an emphasis on you may not have the exact same way of getting your information in CIVI CRM, but there is a way. And it's totally customizable. You just have to think it through a little bit ahead of time. Is that? Uh, just a, and just a couple notes from my side. So there, like um, Deborah had brought up, they were currently using Sage Fundraising, which was hosted on the Reach Out and Read National Server in DC. Boston. Boston. So they had one remote login to remote into the server in Boston, and then a login to get onto their Sage there. And it wasn't being supported anymore. So when it came to actually getting one back to the previous slide, when I talk about where is it and how can it be accessed, we spent a couple of weeks figuring that part out because it wasn't just as easy as I could get in their old system and pull down the database or, you know, there was, it was very, and because they weren't supporting it anymore, they didn't have anyone at their national data, uh, at their national place that I could really work with or talk to. They had a couple people that were like, sure, we can help, you know, but they didn't, they didn't have an, I, that department anymore. They didn't have a SAGE team anymore. So knowing where it is and that it's an easy, we can give so-and-so a login, they can get in and pull it down, or not so easy in our instance of, okay, and then, um, you know, we came, we ran into the, the idea and issue of, okay, so if I can get the data now, then you guys, anything you enter from here forward isn't going to be in there. And because the process of getting the data was so time consuming anyway, we had to figure out, okay, well, how are we going to do this in that interim while we're moving the data into Civi CRM? And so what seemed like, oh, yeah, we'll just get the data from SAGE going into it ended up being a, at least a month process of how are we actually going to do this. So really knowing where your your legacy data is coming from and the process of get it, having access to it is huge. Kind of, I think, a lesson learned for us of we thought it was, yeah, we know where it is, but we didn't really know the details and how it was going to be to get it out. Yeah, Did you run the two systems in parallel for a while using both actively, or did you have like a cutover? We, both. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we did try to do a clean cut over, but we kept access to the old system okay. just in case we needed to run a report or find some sort of information okay. in a way that we couldn't, we didn't know how yet. But in so Civi, the new data was like starting new today. New data, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So new stuff all went in Civi, but we still kept the old just in case. And then there are oh. tricks you can share about how you work together to sort of see what the properties or the characteristics of the data in the old system was and map those? Did you do like big whiteboards or? Is that, have um, you it was a, a lot more of kind of email back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of kind of mapping and then for, like Deborah was talking about the way that they were doing tracking donations in their old system and she was talking about the, um, the different tags. I think if it, I think it was the events one or maybe the solicitations one, there were over 300 different tags because they were very, they were almost like notes or like very kind of individualized things. And this was stuff, historical data that they needed to keep, but we weren't going to move forward doing it that way. Um, so we did do a lot of kind of back and forth of kind of, I would have like a spreadsheet of the old um, field names and then I would, have another column with these are the new ones and we sent it back and forth and no we don't need this or this is more important than this and you know just kind of a lot of back and forth on that and mainly with Deborah on that a little bit with Perry but um, Deborah and I really kind of did that mainly together um, to f and still some of it trying to figure out exactly where it should live or 
And what was the data cleanup process like? How did you actually do that? Um, like I said, there, for everyone I've worked with, their data was by far the cleanest I've ever worked with. Um, so it was very easy. Um, I just, I have some, prog some macros and some different programs I've written that in Excel and using some different things. So I just kind of did them through there. Um, made sure we didn't have any duplicates. Um, went through and the other big difference is they, in their Sage, it wasn't by, it was by individuals, but it was by um, couples. So if it was like John and Joe Smith, it wasn't John Smith and Joe Smith, it was John and Joe Smith were one record. Um, and so we chose to split them and put them in as individuals in CIVI. We actually are in the process of potentially redoing that, which I'll let Deb and um, Perry talk about later. But so that was, again, that was just me kind of doing a bunch of data manipulation on my end and then sending reports to Deb and say, okay, the, are these, take a look at these lists. Does this look like the right, have I matched the couples correctly? And, and um, because of the nature of their work, there were lots of doctors and making sure that their, you know, all the prefixes got in correctly. And so there was definitely quite a lot of manipulation on my end of sit, cutting up their existing data. As far as cleaning it, it really, like they had done an incredible job. There were not a whole lot of duplicates or just like really bad data. So I didn't have to do a ton of cleaning. So basically you were doing that in an intermediate step where you got the data from say, put it on the big spreadsheets and then when you're finally ready, Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Did you guys take all your data? All of it? Like, no matter how old it had been in, in the old system? Well, we'd only had the other system since 2006. Oh, okay. So, so there was a natural cutoff. Cause, yeah. And we did talk about that at one point. Is there anything that we you're collecting in here that we don't need? Again, while their system was very unique as internally as an organization, they'd done a pretty good job of really what do we want to be tracking and tracking only what they needed. And so we decided for their sake to go ahead and take all of it just because it wasn't too long and it was relatively clean um, so that we could do it that way. I've done other ones where no, it's just, yeah. <laughs> no. And but then even since then, we've gone in and taken out stuff that we decided we didn't need yeah. but after, it, the it, after the fact. But that felt better than <laughs> at the time. And then exactly. Just for context, there is about 3,500 to 4,000 records that we were dealing with. And when Deb said that we could tag a gift, um, like that meant an individual could give a gift uh, and it would be in the individual rec, be under an individual giving record, but then tagged as a corporate donation, okay? Um, to Deb, who had been doing that for five years, that was an advantage to a development director who you know was coming in and just wanted things to be um well of course if it's a corporate gift it should be entered as a corporate gift that was a disadvantage and so those are some of the things we kind of went through in that um kind of cleanup and migration process i wanted to be as minimally involved on the technical aspect as possible um you know i mean again my job is to make money for the organization not you know, not spend too much time, you know, kind of on the back end and, you know, designing systems. And so I think that that's, we were able to, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, when we, when we mapped it out with the dialogue uh, through Kate and Deb, um, you know, we were able to do that. I think as we've, it's like anything, uh, it's kind of an evolution as we, once, once putting it in place, we see there's, you know, some, you know, kind of continual kind of enhancements. It's, we're a year out now, we're, we're going to tweak a little bit more. But one thing I would say about all the data is that we had run, you know, myriad tags and campaigns for things like two newsletters a year so we would we would want to see how newsletter performs so we would tag that as a campaign right and this is going back to 2006 and we had special events and you know things of that nature and so in the import and in the transition going you know into civi i think one of the things we did um, was to be able to create a searchable um, a reporting field that was the sage solicitation code and so rather than being um, Rather than having to put, you know, kind of change, I mean, which would have been, I think, scores of work to kind of re-enter everything and, you know, kind of figure out how that how that all lived. And you can speak to the technical end of that. We were able to 
um, have our old searchable codes, the solicitation codes, and have that as a field that we can then, when we enter that in in, in the report uh, things, it'll it'll uh, give us all the information uh, from those reports that our old database could do. And so that I thought was a really uh, innovative way uh, to do that. Yeah. So it was a, a cust. They like he said they had about 300 solicitation codes, and we weren't going to create 300 campaigns within Civi CRM for this because it just it it would it was using the campaign and solicitation very differently than Civi CRM. So in order to not lose that, we just created I think three or four custom fields within to track that so that historically we could pull the reports and stuff the right way, but that moving forward, now they're using solicitations right. and campaigns very, you know, in a similar way, but in a more, a, a way that works better for Civi. Yeah. How much time did you keep the two systems to be, uh, running? Right. Um, we trying to think of how the best put it. We pretty much only referenced it for a couple of months because eventually we realized everything we need is in Civi. We had ways of using the old codes to pull reports, so we really didn't need the other system anymore. Because it was on our national server, I think technically it's still there. Um, we just don't use it. Um, and eventually they will just shut that down and, and be done with it. Um, but I would say a couple of months. Um, was really as much as we referenced back to it just to make sure uh, that we could get accurate, accurate information. But once we learned and felt comfortable with Civi, that's all we used. Once, once we were going this way on the import end and data entry end, Deb was, we, you know, we, we went live and we were putting everything in. We had a major event and that we were using Civi for that. We, uh, you know, all of our um, 2014 information was, was going into the new database. For somebody who um, needed to kind of, you know, kind of go back and look at what was performance like last year, so we can see, you know, how how are we comparing? It was more of a comparison thing at at that point in the early months because, um, you know, it was from a process of getting familiar with how do we go in and put in the Sage solicitation code and so forth. So it was more historical, I think, um, for those first couple of months, if as a reference point for anything. But uh, once we were really able to kind of navigate through that. Um, we left that old database behind uh, pretty quick and with a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, I think we went live July, beginning of July. You had your annual event October, and mm -hmm. all the event data was going into mm -hmm. into Civi. So, um, so once again, kind of on that note. So then we did moving, we have mapped everything, we figured out exactly where we wanted to go and then actually doing the import. Um, you can move the data the way Civi CRM is. You could, there is a user interface so anyone can go and import a CSV or an Excel file into the database um, or there's the API and what I call the back-end tools that you can use to also do that in a more robust way. The, the user interface is limited in how many records you can do as a, at a time and some of that also depends on your server and, and your, where you're hosting and all that. Um, but those are kind of the, the two ways from just a Civi CRM perspective, there's two different ways to get the data into the system, either through a less technical user interface or through a more technical back-end API. And for them, for Reach Out and Read, we did the, I did the API, the back end, and then I'll let you guys. So really, that decision depends on your staff and who has time. And I mean, if you have a dedicated IP person, that might fall right into their job description. We did not. Um, and we decided that our, you know, our staff time was more valuable in other uh, endeavors than switching over databases. So we did decide to hire Kate to do that. Um, something she's mentioned before is the household versus individuals. Um, that is something where we went ahead and took the recommendation of setting up a couple as a household linked with a relationship to each individual record. Um, the benefit of that was that if only one person was attending an event, we could sign them in as attending the event. Um, and it generates a lovely name badge just for them. And the guest list is accurate. What we found as a downside of that is that when we're trying to pull 
um, a couple's giving for the entire year, it's got to be able to find both the household and the individuals to include all of their giving if we had entered things in different records. So what we're finding for our purposes is that we would prefer to take out the individuals if they are related to a household, just make it Jane and Joe Smith, keep all of the giving, whether it's an event ticket to uh, a regular annual donation to anything else, keep it all in that one record. Um, tagged as individual, but knowing that the name is Jane and Joe Smith and that all their information is there. Um, what that will probably translate into is when we sign them up for an event, we may need to do some manipulating of the name badge and you know take out Joe if he's not coming. Um, but ultimately, for our purposes, we don't really care whether Joe attended or Jane attended. We just know that one of them attended and they gave. And just to, and we haven't made that change yet. We We're, change yet. I suggested they wait until after CiviCon and <laughs> then we'll go, go from there. Because I know that I, I, there is lots of talk within Civi CRM of some people really like households, some people don't, some people just like relationships. There's, so, there's many ways to do it and they historically are used to doing it as one record for everyone. Um, and I kind of convinced them that it was maybe a good idea to separate them. Um, we've talked about, you know, if they are paying with a credit card online and it comes in as John Smith, then it's not going to match a record in Civi because of the name and some things like that. So reasons why there's, also, there's other benefits to it. Um, but this is one thing that we struggled with at the beginning and we're continuing to struggle with now. Yeah, I was going to ask, in thinking about that, did you also discuss um, requirements for tax uh, acknowledge, acknowledgement of gifts for tax purposes to an individual rather than to a couple? Well, I, I'm trying to think now how our thank you letters are addressed. I'm pretty certain that even if we have individual records, most of our correspondence is still addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Smith or Jane and Joe Smith. So regardless of who made the gift, our acknowledgement letters have always gone to the household. I don't know if that <laughs> is right or not, but that's always how we've done it. I, I think the other thing with that too, and I, I think we're, you know, again, the, the, on, on this point, I think we're still a little bit learning some of the, some of the nuances, but I, on my own record, I, Perry Jowsey, okay, in the database. Um, w you know, I could be an individual, and then in the um, salutation uh, field down within that record, in the preferred salutation, I think is what it's called, I could say, you know, Perry and Trenton Jowsey, my son, right? You could put that in there. And so then when the acknowledgments generate, even though it's in an individual record as just me, um, in that acknowledgment generation, um, that would account for multiple names within that file. I think that, um, you know, in systems like with Razor's Edge, you've got a primary record, right, and then a secondary record that you could kind of attach that kind of lives behind quietly, you know, within that, right? Um, and so, you know, I was initially confused with this because I'd never dealt with individuals versus households or things of that nature and never had seen that. It's, well, why they're individuals? Why, why do we not, you know, just why isn't this easier than it is? And I think part of it is that um, um, I, I, and, and I think it was a good recommendation at first, and this is where I think with Kate and Deb, when they were talking about it, um, you know, going with the individuals, splitting the households and going with the individuals worked really well from the event management standpoint. Like Deb said, that's a, that's a major tool in, of the database, and from the event standpoint, that worked great. I was kind of the sticky wicket in the situation because I was saying, well, if somebody's buying, if a couple, a, a mem uh, an individual is buying an event ticket or an individual makes a purchase at the event and then the other individual, you know, is, um, you know, uh, then, then a gift comes in later in the year and we credit it to them as, you know, as, as a couple, it, it would, it would, when, when we would do the reports at a, at a glance, it wasn't there. There'd be, you know, it would count. 
Um, if we're looking for the total number of donors in a year, for instance, we might have that individual counted, and then again, is that household counted? You know what I mean? And that was the that was one of the tricks that that we had because then we just our goal is to have it be one click, get everything we need, not not try to think through, you know, what the what the system does, and it can do that, and I think that that's you know kind of you know where we're where we're moving to. Um, question two, and you, you referenced using having your son um, referred to um, when they're obviously when they're juveniles, and we're not really talking about them much. But in this age where we're now actually having generational generational giving to organizations, I, I could imagine just hypothetically that my son would have as many similar but yet different interests in terms of who he wants to spend his time and money with, and so by not parsing them or by including them as a household, you might create a data situation in the future that is more, that is hard to untangle. Mm -hmm. So in, in the tax, per being one, when they go off to college, being another, I need to change addresses. So those are some of the things that I'm at. It, kind of a question to you as a developer, um, are there not other ways to, to merge households by saying, individuals and then identification as equals so there you can do tons of relationships and you yeah. can create like so there's employer of employee sibling spouse okay. child all those different yes yeah. so there's the there's households and then there's also relationships so you can just tie in a lot of organizations I've heard just also use the relation, they don't even use households, they just tie people together with relationships. So there's kind of those two ways. And like I said, I know when I attended CiviCon last year, I think I heard five different discussions and five <laughs> different opinions. And it was like, ah, I don't like which way, you know, and so it kind of is, depends on your organization, how your historical data is, that kind of thing um, to which choice you make. Another reason why I encourage them here this week, ask everyone you talk to how they do theirs, and get opinions and different things, just because there is two ways to do it and there's tons of opinions for and against both ways. Yeah. Yeah, there are more than two ways to do it. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> um, I think the key really is that once, you have to make a clear decision about how you're gonna do it and then be very consistent about so know how you're going to put your data in always, and then know how you're going to pull your reports from that data, because it, it can be done in a number of ways. But um, if you are doing it, if you are doing it one way one day and another way mm -hmm. the other day, then you end up with a mess. I guess I was just going to ask if you're also looking at potentially using soft credits instead, as as another alternative to merging together. We did use soft credits um, because they do have the situation already um, where people can donate in honor of or in those, those. So yes, we already, we have put in records historically using soft credits um, and have used those for, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that some organizations use soft credits to make sure that they keep the husband and wife, let's say, separate. But if the husband gives, they, they give a soft credit to the wife mm -hmm. so that they understand the total giving mm -hmm. from her as well. Yeah, and they can, they can rank her in the college or something. And we did consider that. Um, our decision was made we were already using soft credits in a different manner, so it didn't, we didn't want to confuse those two. So, for example, if a corporation sends a check, and some of that is the employee's um, like payroll contribution, we will soft credit the other to make sure that they're both credited for that same contribution. So we use it in that regard and didn't want to try using it for something new that might change so some reporting. In the early recent but versions, there are now soft credit types. Ah, so we don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and we have this. We have an upgrade. We that's been on our correct. List upgrades are on our list. list. Yes. <laughs> and then this whole discussion too is not even including extensions or things that are currently being worked on. So I know that right now they're working on how to um, alphabetize household last names within so that they can be pulled alphabetically along with individual records, which is. You know, so that's being worked on. So there's constantly new stuff being worked on. There are extensions that can kind of take care of these problems too, and new things come out in new versions. So, and just since 
Deborah brought it up, uh, what we did with the household thing, because we were trying to pull alphabetically and you couldn't, we were struggling. So we, in the nickname field, it has just the last name without household and everything. So we can, we can sort things differently by other columns. So there's tons, I mean, it's like Perry said, we can make it work for them. It's just figuring out which way works the best. Um, and then one other one I wanted to just quickly jump to because Deborah mentioned we've gone back in and deleted it. They had a lot of past event data and it was like, you know, so and so's son attended and there was like, it was like a no name kind of a thing or something like that. And so at first I said, do we want this data or not? And we decided at first that they wanted it. So we moved it all over. In Civi, everyone has to have an, a, an email ad address associated with them. And so we didn't have, for some of these, no, what we, I'm calling no name records, we didn't have some of that. So we, I, I did some manipulation stuff on the back end and created fake emails for these. But then when Deborah went in to do a search, it was like a mess. And so <laughs> since we decided that we don't need to know the no names who attend. Like, again, they're not no names. We just didn't know their names for the attend. We don't want that historical data um, per se. So we've gotten rid of some of those things and decided some of that historical stuff that we don't need anymore just to help keep it clean also. So I was just thinking about the no name thing and again sort of taking the child and the growing our family giving concept. Is there any reason why you can't simply associate by using a a common, you know, parent email or whatever. Just, I mean, no. Um, you can also or, or, have or just or use the last name. You know right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, or you could use well, you, but you rules. need something besides, yeah, you need to you have set your duplicate rules. rules. So right. So the email, we look at the email and the first and the, last name. Right. But I would create an individual contact record for the child exactly. and, and then relate them into the household. Right. And, the, and the instance was here, we didn't have names for yeah, so for the, really you know, it trouble. wasn't, yeah, we just didn't have, you know, it was like guest of or child of, and oh, so problem. we didn't have, you didn't have any anything. Okay. Yeah. And we thought we wanted to, <laughs> to keep it so that we had an idea of a number of event, at, you know, we could pull some historical stuff on event attendees and the number of people attended and so registered and different things really like really that, like but that. we decided that that didn't, didn't help us out. And made it worse, well, you so. have historical reports from those years past, anyway, right? In well, theory. <laughs> In theory. <laughs> it was also a matter of, you know, we had this event, it was great, it was a, for parents and children, and so all we asked was how many children are coming with you because we needed to know. But there would be like, you know, Smith Child 1, Smith Child 2. Gotcha. Um, which for the event was important. Mm -hmm. We needed to know how many kids were coming. Later on, we really don't care about Smith Child. And those, right, not, <laughs> those events aren't happening anymore either. That was a one-time event, event, so, event anymore, so yeah. We're not, yeah. So the, these are kind of going into this fourth phase now is kind of this training in use and um, the importance of, as Deb said, when we were working together, it was like, I don't, I, know, I don't know, I need to get in and use it to really know. So they, once the, it was up and live and they'd had, they had their event in October and then, you know, once that kind of calmed down and they'd use the whole civvy for an event and where, what do we need to tweak and do differently and we're still having some of those conversations. So just the importance of training the staff to use the database and not only just to use the database but changes in organization process and procedures and workflow and you know we aren't tracking it this way anymore this is how we now enter it and those different things that it's really more about change management at this point than it is about the database and really the importance of change management and making sure that that conversation is constantly being had within the organization so that everyone is kind of on the same page when it comes to okay, it's go live day and now we're using it this way and so that everyone kind of understands how that process is. Because I think that's one thing from my experience, I have over 10 years ex of experience in nonprofits as the database manager or coordinator that a lot of organizations don't really think about. It's just kind of like, okay, we decided to do this, we need to go, come on, come on, come on, come on when we need it. And then you start and then it's like, oh, we didn't even talk about how, well, this person's not doing this anymore and, you know, or this needs to happen this way. And so really making sure you're having that change management kind of conversation and, ch and conversation around, let's talk about what our process is for this and 
um, how is that going to change now and hopefully usually it's a good conversation because it's going to take responsibility or tasks away from people um, and make their lives easier but just making sure that everyone's having that conversation so I'll hand it off to you guys I think that's really well said about the change management piece and again I would venture to say um, that I, I'm probably the least technical person in the room. Um, I, I think that's a safe bet. Um, regardless of that, um, in, and I don't know how many fundraising professionals are in the room, um, but in the 20 plus million dollars that I've raised in my career, what I found is that th I see it like almost like as a pyramid. There's your planning and your analytics that you do just from your fundraising perspective. And then on the next level, are your systems and the execution. And then at the top is the performance. And your systems and your execution, I mean, to, to me, to perform from a, you know, from a fundraising perspective, the systems and the execution need to be there. And I keep telling everyone around the office that, you know, this is a major, under this is a major shift in infrastructure, but also in organizational culture, if you will, too. I mean, we're making a, we're, we're, we're making a, a whole, a system-wide change and again keeping in mind that you know uh, when we started this too we only have four full-time employees so we don't have a major you know kind of bandwidth to you know have somebody like really being the IT person in the office that's not that's not what our reality um, but we are evolving to I, I really believe to be able to have this thing be the one click you know uh, that, that has never existed in our organization. And so that is a change management thing. But it takes steps along the way. And, and some of it you don't realize until you get there. So for instance, as on this slide, it says adjustments around you know donations, grants. You know, for instance, in our old system, we didn't enter things as grants. They were entered as contributions. It was a foundation contribution. I don't know, maybe one of those tags was grants. I don't know if that was a tag or not. Um, tags is foundation, right? But so in, when we just imported things over because they weren't grants, they came over as contributions, right? So that's one of the things where um, that, that by doing that, that makes the historical grant report, um, you know, yeah, basically useless to me, right? Uh, using grant reports. And so what we've gone through is, you know, um, kind of talk about the process of, okay, you know, now, now that we know that based on how things lived previously, let's fix that and let's have, um, you know, get those all, because we've got, you know, uh, we're, you know, basically 10 years of operation here and foundations that have supported us every year and, you know, um, we raise about four to $500,000 a year from foundations, anywhere from $100,000 to Five hundred dollars, you know, and so um, we want to be able to be able to at a at a click be able to see how things are performing and, and be able to inform our process and plans. And um, just in the immediate transfer, because of how things live, that that it wasn't that way. But with uh, with Kate's help, and you know, with that change management, and with this database, we're getting there. Was there training that you do for them, or how does that all take place? Because um, I've talked to a lot of companies. Sometimes they have a hard time getting certain staff members to use it, or to use, you know, put things in there. Sure. Um, and we've had a couple things. One, we did uh, part of Kate's process was providing us uh, staff-wide training, um, so that everybody knows how to look up a record, how to enter a new record, how to look up a donation, that kind of thing. We were fortunate enough that really only about three of us use the database on a daily basis. Um, you know, Perry wants to look up the money, I want to enter the money, um, someone else might need a, a mailing list, you know, that kind of thing. So even though we're now at a staff of almost 10, starting in May, we'll, we'll, there'll be 10 of us, but not everybody uses it regularly. So yes, we did have all in-office staff trained on what it looks like, how to access it, you've got your own password, you can get there. Um, not everybody uses it that frequently. And just uh, to kind of add what I provided 
Um, I did uh, staff training and I record, similar like we are now, I record everything. So because they're a growing organization, they have the copies of all of my trainings so that their new staff can participate. Um, I also, part of my services is to provide a user manual so that they have some steps and processes and screenshots and things like that. So I've provided that and then I also have, have always been more than happy to take a phone call or an email or whatever for new staff or for you know Deborah will I don't know what I'm doing how you know can you remind me how to do this um, again I I personally in providing my service video almost everything that I do for them so that they because I know I'm a huge visual learner so if I can go back and rewatch something it's it's huge for me so I've showed Deb how to do lots of things and recorded it while we're doing it so that then she can go back and say, oh, we did this two months ago. I can't remember how we did it and, and have the resources herself. I'm all about giving them the tools and then letting them run with it, so. Before your question, I would just say that to, answer, to finish answering your question, I think the reality that I've learned is change is hard uh, in, in, you know, especially you know, our ex we have an executive director who's been the executive director for 10 years. Uh, Deb's been the office manager for six, six years, you know. And so, uh, you know, that's a lot of time together uh, in a very small environment doing things a very specific way. And I think that, um, you know, it's bu it's before you get, it's it's almost like, you know, the, the, uh, the title of the presentation is you've chosen CVCRM, now what, right? It's that part of getting to, once you make the choice, it's almost, the, it's not the technical part, it's the organizational cultural part where you need to have everybody on board saying, we understand that, you know, we need to make a change and, you know, most times when you make a change, it's not like this. You don't automatically go straight up and everything's great right from the beginning. It looks kind of like this. Right? Think of that with leadership changes in organizations and so forth. You know, you don't get a great leader to replace, um, you know, a, um, a lesser leader and just go straight up. A lot of times there's that, that process of adjustment where, you know, the, you take that time to adapt and then you go forward. And I think as an organization, um, when you understand that in the beginning and you embrace that change and realize um, that it's not an event, it's a process, that, uh, you know, you go a long way toward um, being able to, you know, kind of, you know, ride the, the peaks and valleys in that process. Um, just, and you may have answered this, I apologize, if it's in another place, that this is much more effective, so thank you. <laughs> um, when you began your migration process, or before you decided, when you decided to take on city CRM as kind of your next phase, did you do a requirements gathering phase to kind of engage your stakeholders internally, i.e. all the people that would be using the database potentially and your users to kind of do an assessment, a migration assessment? Or did you just sort of try this yourself, take one stab at it by looking at all of your reports and seeing if you could kind of map them together? I mean, I'm just wondering. Because I'm a mega geek, and I, so I don't know if that's how. I, did, I don't know uh, how people normally. Part of my it. process when I very first start with a client is I kind of have a survey that's, what are your just goes through what are your workflows, what kind of data are you collecting, what do you want to be doing. So they had, I think Megan even filled mm -hmm. it out. There so they're nice. the two of them and their executive director filled that out. And like they said, when when I started with them just a year ago, it was. Small. I was just, you know, either I wasn't working with really anyone besides the two of them. Where now today, they have a third member of their staff who's here attending these things, and they've grown. So it's changed quite a bit just in the last year. But I personally, from working with them and and with my clients, have them kind of go through the survey of the different, you know, what are absolute have to haves and and different things, um, and a little bit maybe around change management change management around just kind of like, again, processes and procedures and stuff internally and, and things. Um, and then I don't know if you guys did anything separately internally, but. I, I think that we, yeah, prior to kind of going to the point where we said, okay, we need to do something, we need to have somebody help us do this. I think that we had the advantage in that things were, um, so poorly functioning, right? That's 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 often that's not often an advantage. But our current system was so frustrating. I mean, there was almost unanimous, there was a unanimous, um, you know, 
dislike, disenchantment for, for what we dealt with on a daily basis and hearing that question, are you in SAGE, um, you know, uh, it, it kind of grates on you, you know? And I think that we kind of had the advantage that that kind of unified us around that. We also knew that, you know, the, the um, system that we were using, I mean, they had maintained it a, a, for at some point or, I, I, and then they said they're not going to do that any. I mean, and it kind of was like the writing was on the wall. Um, actually, this you know this terrible system that we have might might not even be there tomorrow, right? So we we had all that um, you know kind of uh, you know as advantages. I would say from in terms of you know migration mapping and things of that nature, the one event. I mean, yeah, I work in fundraising and. Generation X, so I've had a lot of jobs, you know, like that's kind of how it goes, you know, like, um, and I've seen a lot of different da databases. I've seen a lot of ways philosophically organizations, you know, kind of keep information. I've seen a lot, um, again, not the back end, but, but the, the user end from a technical standpoint. And so considering that this was mostly a, the primary function of this tool for us was for the fundraising um, features, um, you know, I was able to say, you know, these are these are really some of the core elements of like where I think what this database can do versus um, you know kind of what's happened historically and even on the user end you know somebody like Deb who's been you know using it for um, you know for six years and in, in terms of um, you know kind of creating the records but also you know running lists running acknowledgement letters you know things of that nature um, I, you know your experience was able to inform that as well. <coughs> So it just kind of in wrapping up, um, I think we kind of, the three of us wanted to kind of have some final takeaways. So um, all, you know, this is in anything I've ever done database-wise, everything take longer than you think it would. We thought that getting the data and the transition would not take too long due to the fact that getting the data was such a challenge, it took us a lot longer. I think our original go live was scheduled for May and it didn't actually happen until July. So everything takes longer. Um, time spent internally really discussing what you want, dreaming big, not worrying about what you're currently constricted to or um, what you think Civi CRM will do. Really, you know, they having, having the conversations for them on this would be awesome, let's do this. And we've started to do a lot more of those now that they're using it and, and have a list of in a perfect world it would do this, this, and this and, and helping them get there. And then um, Perry wanted to, to enforce that you can implement this at, affor at an affordable cost um, for those, it's you know you don't have to pay for it to download it. You can just download it, et cetera. But the the process of getting it up and running it at an affordable cost. Yeah, I, I just thought that was you know crucial. Again, as the least technical guy in the room, if I was sitting here in this presentation a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, you know I I'd, I'd say okay, great. I hear all this functionality that it can do. You're seeing it can do everything that Razor's Edge can do. You you know you've used both. It's gonna you know you're 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 gonna feel like it can can do all that stuff and maybe more. When you when you if you factor in things about integrating it in with QuickBooks or integrating it with Constant Contact and things we didn't talk about, you know, um, you know all of those things and and the you know I would you know be a little bit intimidated thinking well you know if I'm working an organization that has four full-time employees um, and we haven't been paying anything for our database uh, yes you're saying this is free but the just the process of getting this. You know, even if you sell me on the concept of this is the database for me, how can my small organization do this? How, you know, how, how, you know, how is that viable? Um, that, would, that was the part that was most, you know, kind of daunting for me. And, uh, you know, I just um, was just through this experience, you know, I can, you know, just say as a, um, you just kind of that direct testimonial that, yes, um, there are costs. It's, I mean, you know, there's, um, it's, it's a free software, but of course, involves expertise and um, upgrades you know with some of the hosting and things that we saw um, but all in all uh, we we're just thrilled to be able to go from um, what we have to where we are and where we know we're going um, at a you know at what we deem um, a very minimal cost and uh, really a, a great investment uh, for what we're doing um, you know in our work and so 
I don't know how many people are in that same you know kind of boat as us, but um, that's it from the user perspective. Uh, that it's it's really something that can be a great tool, and it's it's something you know even if you don't have that expertise, you've got people like Kate, you've got people experts here, uh, in this room, and throughout the you know throughout the center, uh, you know who really could help get this in place for you, um, and that's just a that's a game changer in my mind. I think that was very well said. Um, I would just emphasize again that it, expect it to take longer than you think it will. Um, even though it's open source does not mean it's free. Um, and just account for that. Um, still cheaper than buying, you know, a whole, some of the other things that are out there. Um, we, and something I wanted to add is we've gone ahead and created a whole uh, donation processing protocol. So just be prepared that, you know, new systems are in place. We outlined how it goes forward and everybody has a copy of that. So just embrace the change, know that it's going to be an adjustment period, but ultimately it's going to serve your purposes better so that everybody can do their job more efficiently. And we feel that CIVI CRM has given us that opportunity. So at this point we're happy to take any other questions specific to how they're using it, or I can answer any questions kind of more in a broad. So you had talked about like constant contact and QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. Are you guys doing those integrations? We're not, we're not currently working, working with that right now. The one that is uh, most clearly on our radar is the constant contact because that is, you know, we do, we do communicate with our constituents and so that's something that, you know, from a development standpoint, it, it's great to know and, um, you know, who's, who's getting things, who's opening things, you know, electronically as well as like these campaigns that we're, that we're putting in, right? Uh, QuickBooks, uh, to, you know, to me, again, in 2011, when I first saw this, I, I remember I was talking to somebody who said, I want a database that can do, do my data file, my donor stuff, my constant contact stuff, and my QuickBooks stuff, and I said, that ah, doesn't exist, you know? I mean, you know, you keep dreaming. Well, that's here. Now, at Reach on Read, we actually outsource our, you know, kind of financials, uh, you know, and so we don't keep that in-house. We don't have a chief financial officer, and so, um, so the utility of that for us, for who who we are as an organization right now is not there for the QuickBooks end. But as again, somebody who's worked in a lot of different offices where we've we've I've seen people um, in the office manager position who, you know, as part of their job, they got, hey, you're gonna manage QuickBooks and you're gonna be the accountant basically by by de facto. Um, that again is a is a is a game changer that I that I see in theory. Um, we are in the process of looking into integrating uh, constant contact. We did briefly consider going to MailChimp because we knew that was existing. Um, we currently have a, our, our constant contact is free because we're sponsored because we work with kids. So we, we have a, you know, a dealie there where, where we get it for free and we weren't quite ready to give up our free account just yet. Um, but you know, it depends on your situation. So MailChimp apparently works very well uh, with Civi, so that's an option. Yeah. City mail? And <laughs> yeah, city I'm wondering city if you played with the built-in. We have not played the city mail. Might be worth looking into. <laughs> and they, they, they've grown, as we've said numerous times, so their staff member who is doing that communication and right, stuff is relatively team. new, and so we, it's, you know, as they grow, then we can expand and adjust. And, and adjust and those kinds of things also. So it's more recently been brought up just because now they've got staff, you know, in there and. But you currently use constant contact. We currently use constant using. contact. Yeah, yes. Yes. For free. yes. Yeah. Right. So you just have to assess what your current situation is, what your needs are, and, and how to accommodate that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Dave. Tell me if this is not appropriate. <laughs> um, I'm curious as to whether you guys worked out together some fixed boundaries around how much it was going to cost you to get from the beginning to where to where you felt like you had something that you could use. Because um, obviously, the biggest expense in getting this going is working with Kate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the question that comes about up. Me too. Yes, and um, I think that again, and and 
you know, as somebody who's worked with a lot of with a lot of small nonprofits as an employee um, in leadership roles, and who's done consulting with small nonprofits uh, and fundraising, um, one of the things that uh, I know is important from the budget perspective is to not have open-ended hourly, um, you know, kind of agreements in place. That is not that's a deal breaker for me. Um, regardless, I don't care if it's twenty dollars an hour. If you can't tell me what that um, a end map is going to be with a with any amount of reliability, I can't sell that to my boss. I can't sell that to my board. I can't sell that to my donors. Not acceptable. And so everything that I've done um, in my fundraising consulting has always been flat fee. Um, you know, it, it requires me, uh, I'm speaking as a, from a consulting standpoint, it requires me kind of estimating, you know, what might be involved in that. Sometimes I've ended up working kind of what I, for, for what I feel is under minimum wage sometimes, you know what I mean, with, for how that's gone. Um, but in most part, I think it's been able to deliver a, you know, a good return uh, for the client. And so um, that was something that, you know, we talked about with Kate in terms of um, asking her to propose a scope of work for us that was a flat fee, all encompassing um, the detail, the deliverables, to define the deliverables as to what we what would happen, what the steps were, what the timeline was, um, and that that would get us to this usable, you know, kind of aspect of it. And she was gracious uh, to do that, and we looked at it, and it was a no-brainer for us. And the way I kind of proposed my proposed my work to them and to others is, is is in kind of in phases like we did this, so that if you did have someone internally who wanted to do the data cleanup and spend hours in Excel, that you didn't have to pay for that part of it. So I broke it all down into it was a fixed fee for all of these different phases, and then af then there were even post implementation phases around support and reports and. Um, the training, having writing a, I wrote a writing the user manual and everything for them. But it was all broken down into um, fixed price phases or chunks, so that they could kind of almost pick and choose what they wanted to um, to pay for. But in just to kind of about my own work, I usually my preference is to work with smaller nonprofits who don't have a very large staff, who don't have this this ability in-house and who don't have the funds to take on a year-long commitment with something or you know a, a two-year commitment with something but they can just take on the commitment of we need someone to help with this chunk and this chunk and this chunk and then maybe down the road we're gonna pay you to do this chunk and this chunk and this chunk but from someone who's worked in nonprofits for over 10 years I'm very aware of the budget constraints and the frustrations of I just want to be able to get this right now this is the service I need and no I don't want to sign on for a year and no I can't pay that um, so that's the kind of service I try and provide in my consultants and are you also providing security updates and uh, yeah so I've kind of become their <laughs> IT person in a sense that and that's under a separate agreement or is it part of your fix it's part of it was part of so th you know I help them upgrade their Bluehost to the to the VPS and go through that process and that was all in that. And I know we're we're ending on time, and so thank you. And uh, our emails are up there. Email us, find us here. If you have any, if, if there's anything we can, Deb and I can answer from the user standpoint going through it. Um, I know Kate would be happy to answer it from the uh, developer implementer standpoint. Um, but you know, again, I, we we think it's uh, we're worlds better off than where we were one year ago, and we wanted to you know just kind of be able to to stand up and you know, be an organization that can, can share that experience. So thanks, thanks for taking the time with that. Yeah.